Welcome to video 31 in our series on tensor calculus. In this video, we'll use the formula we derived in the last video to evaluate the Christoffel symbols in each of our sample coordinate systems. Here we have the formula we derived in the last video for the Christoffel symbol of the first kind. So let's look first at Cartesian coordinates. And in uh, Cartesian coordinates, you'll remember that the covariant metric tensor is made up of uh, constants. It's just the identity matrix. So the, all the partial derivatives of that uh, tensor are going to be zero. So each of these terms will drop out, leaving us with the fact that uh, all of the Christoffel symbols are equal to zero. Here on the fact sheet, you can see that the covariant metric tensor is in fact made up only of constants and therefore we can uh, simply record the Christoffel symbols as being non-existent. They're all equal to zero. Now the same thing is going to happen for affine coordinates. Here we have the covariant metric tensor for affine coordinates. All of these uh, elements within this tensor our constants are the parameters that define our affine coordinate system. We have the scaling factors and the skew angle. They're all constants, so the partial derivatives are all going to be zero. So just like uh, Cartesian coordinates, there are no non-zero values for the Christoffel symbol in affine coordinates. We'll turn our attention now to plane polar coordinates. Here I've copied down the metric tensors. On the left we have the covariant metric tensor and on the right the contravariant metric tensor. Okay, well uh, in this case we're dealing with two dimensions, therefore each of the values of i, j, and k can assume values of one or two. And that means we have eight different possibilities for our Christoffel symbol. Now I've taken the liberty to list all the possibilities here on the left. Now, although there are eight possibilities, you'll notice I've combined a couple of them, this one and this one, and the reason is because we know that the right two indexes are symmetric, so if I flip these, uh, the order of these two, I'm going to get the same result. So we only need to calculate one of these and one of these. So even though we have a total of eight possibilities, we've only got to evaluate six combinations. Of course, we can just grind our way through the uh, evaluation of these six possibilities using our formula in a mechanical way. But if we do a little bit of upfront analysis, we can uh, cut down a number of possibilities and save quite a bit of work. Um, here's what we want to point out. In the covariant metric tensor, there's only one component that is not constant. It is uh, element 2, 2. And furthermore, that element depends only upon the uh, variable of uh, r. It does not depend in any way on uh, theta. So um, that means that the only partial derivative that is non-zero in this example is the partial derivative of z2, 2, 2 with respect to z1. It's just the partial derivative of uh, this guy right here with respect to r. And the answer to that is going to be, of course, just 2r. Now, um, once again, there are no other possibilities. If we take the partial derivative of z11, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, they're all going to be 0 because they're, they're constant. And the partial derivative of z22 2, 2 with respect to z2 is 0 because this does not depend on theta in any way. So where that leads us is that um, if uh, any of the Christoffel symbols are going to be non-zero, they have to contain this factor. Somewhere in this list of uh, elements, we have to have this particular factor uh, or, you know, to, to come off with a non-zero result for Christoffel IJK. And because the indexes here are permuted from one term to the other, then the only way that this term can wind up in one of these three locations is if the set of indices i, j, and k are some permutation 
of the indexes 2, 2, and 1. For example, um, this one is 0 because there's, if, if we were to plug these values in for i, j, and k, 1, 1, and 1, then all of these elements, none of these elements are going to be equal to this. So the value is equal to 0. Okay, well the same is going to be true for this one, and this one, and this one. What we see is that the only possibilities, the only non-zero possibilities for our Christoffel symbols are this one and these two. And you'll notice that the indexes on each of these three is some permutation of 2, 2, and 1. Those are the only ones that are possible if this is the only non-zero partial derivative of our covariant metric tensor. So that means that we only have to uh, use our formula twice, once to evaluate this possibility and once to evaluate this possibility. Okay, so let's work our way through it. Well, if we're going to uh, find the value for uh, 1, 2, 2, then that's going to be the case where i is 1. So this term right here would be equal to this. And the other two terms would be equal to 0. So if this term is 2r, and there's a negative sign, and it's negative 2r times 1 half, then the result for this guy is just negative r, like that. Okay, the other example down here, we'll take uh, 2, 1, 2. This is a case where j is 1, so this is the term that would be equal to this right here. The other two terms are going to be 0. So if this is 2r, this time it's positive 2r times a half, which means the result of this is just r. Now, we already know because of the symmetry that 2, 2, 1 is is going to be the same, but let's just uh, work through that too, just to illustrate it. If we were looking for 2, 2, 1, this time k is 1, and it's this guy that's equal to this, the other two being 0, this is 2r, again a half of 2r is just r, like that. Okay, so now we have the results for the only possible values that are non-zero. The next step in the parade is to find the values of the uh, Christoffel symbol of the second kind. And you'll remember that that's just a matter of raising the first index. So gamma i, j, k for our Christoffel symbol of the second kind is just going to be equal to our contravariant metric tensor element z, i, m times the Christoffel symbol of the first kind, m, j, k, like so. so I've got, now that we have uh, the values of the Christoffel symbol of the first kind, and we have the contravariant metric tensor, we use this formula to find the Christoffel symbol of the second kind. Well, a couple things here. First of all, the um, many of these are zeros, and any of the ones that have zeros will drop out, so the only Christoffel symbols that we need to evaluate are the ones that correspond to those that are non-zero. So we're going to be looking for the Christoffel symbol of the second kind as 1, 2, 2, and we're also going to be looking for 2, 1, 2, and as with this one, the lower indexes are symmetric, so these two are going to yield exactly the same value. Thus, we have only three non-zero possibilities, and because of the symmetry, we only need to apply this formula um, for two separate cases. Now, the other thing we've got going for us is the fact that we're dealing with an orthogonal system, which means that all we have are the diagonal elements, like so. Thus, we only need to consider the elements of our contravariant metric tensor where i and m are the same. Only the diagonal elements live here. So there's only going to be one term in each of these expressions. In other words, to find this value, all I have to do is multiply this guy times this. 
And of course, that answer is trivial. It's just minus r. Okay, so in the next case, all I've got to do is to multiply this expression times this term. And that's going to be equal to simply r times 1 over r squared is just 1 over r, like so. So the final result is that these guys are the only non-zero results for our Christoffel symbols in plane polar coordinates. So let's flip over and update our fact sheet. For plane polar coordinates, these are the only non-zero Christoffel symbols of the first kind, and these are the only non-zero Christoffel symbols of the second kind. Okay, let's move on to cylindrical polar coordinates. The results for cylindrical polar coordinates are going to be virtually identical to those of plane polar coordinates, but we'll run through their uh, derivation anyway just for the practice of it. For um, our cylindrical polar coordinates, these are the metric tensors. This time, of course, we're dealing in a three-dimensional example. The values of our indexes can uh, range from 1 to 3, which means we have possibly as many as 27 Christoffel symbols to evaluate. But um, remember our little technique. What we're going to do is to recognize that there's only one expression in our covariant metric tensor that is not a constant. And it's only a factor of one variable, rho. So out of all 27 possible uh, partial derivatives of our covariant metric tensor, there's only one that's non-zero, and it's the partial of z22 with respect to z1. And it's simply equal to 2 rho. So make sure you understand this point, that um, the covariant metric tensor's got nine terms. Eight of them are fixed, they're constants. One of them is a variable, but it's a variable only of rho. It's not dependent upon phi or on z. So this is the only partial derivative that is non-zero. That, in turn, leads us to know that the only possible Christoffel symbols that are non-zero are the ones that make use of these three index values in one permutation or another. So we're looking for this possibility, and we're looking for this possibility. And because of the symmetry of the last two indexes, we're also looking for this possibility. Now, we're guaranteed that out of the 27 possible results, Christoffel symbols, these three are the only ones that can possibly be non-zero, because they're the only ones where this factor right here winds up somewhere in our formula up there. OK, let's work through them. We um, First of all, we'll look at 1, 2, 2. And if i is 1, that means that this guy is equal to this. So this would be 2 rho. The others are 0. So we have a half times negative 2 rho is simply negative rho. OK. In the next example, we have 2, 1, 2. Here j is 1. That means that this term is the same as this guy. The other two are zeros. This is 2 rho. 1 half of 2 rho is just rho, like so. It's as easy as that. OK, now to get the corresponding uh, Christoffel symbols of the second kind, we're going to be looking for 1, 2, 2. And we're going to be looking here for 2, 1, 2 and 2, 2, 1. Again, we recognize because of the symmetry of the lower indexes, these will give the same results. So all I've got to do is to raise the first index in each case, which means that for this guy, I've got to multiply this by this, and I get negative rho. 
and then for the next one I've got to multiply this by this term and I get 1 over rho like this and we're done so if we uh, flip over to our cylindrical polar coordinate fact sheet, we'll drop those in place. Here are the Christoffel symbols of the first kind, and here are the Christoffel symbols of the second kind. And as I said, they're virtually identical to plain polar coordinates. Okay, and finally we'll consider spherical polar coordinates. For spherical polar coordinates, we have these for our metric tensors. And uh, you'll notice that there are only two elements in our covariant metric tensor that are not constants. Therefore, the only possible non-zero partial derivatives are z to 2 with respect to z1, which is just this one with respect to r, and that's equal to 2r. And then... Uh, the second one is we have the partial of z3,3 with respect to z1, which is this taken with respect to r, which is equal to 2r sine squared theta. And the last possibility is the partial of z3,3 with respect to z2. This is with respect to theta, and that's going to give us 2 r squared sine theta cosine theta. Okay, those are the only possible non-zero partial derivatives of our covariant metric tensor. Therefore, we can see that our Christoffel symbols are going to be limited to these. We might have 1, 2, 2. We might have 2, 1, 2, which will be equal to 2, 2, 1. That takes care of the first partial up here. And we might have, uh, what is it, 1, 3, 3, or 3, 1, 3, which will be equal to 3, 3, 1. And that takes care of the second partial. And finally, we might have, uh, what is it, 2, 3, 3, or 3, 2, 3, which by symmetry is equal to 3, 3, 2. Now, again, because these are the only possible non-zero partial derivatives, these are the only possible non-zero Christoffel symbols. Okay, so let's work through them one at a time. Let's start with uh, 1, 2, 2. And if that's the case, i is 1, so this expression will be equal to this, or 2r. Since there's a negative sign times a half, then this is negative r. Okay, um, if we have, uh, what, 2, 1, 2 then j is 1, which means this term is equal to 2r, and the others are 0, so that result leaves us with simply r here. Okay, now if we do uh, what's next, uh, 1, 3, 3, then this guy would be equal to 2r sine squared theta, negative sine times a half, means this is equal to negative r sine squared theta. All right, and then uh, 3, 1, 3, where j is equal to 1. This expression equals this. Same result as uh, the one above, except it's positive. So it's going to be r sine squared theta. And then um, what's next? 2, 3, 3 means that this guy matches this. It's negative, and a half of it is going to give us negative r squared sine theta cosine theta. And finally, 
3, 2, 3, where j is equal to 2 means this guy equals that. Same result as above, except that it's positive. r squared sine theta cosine theta. So there are your six possibilities for the Christoffel symbol of the first kind. So now we have to raise the index on each of these to get the Christoffel symbol of the second kind. So uh, we'll start by recognizing that this guy and this one, because the first index is 1, we'll need to multiply by this. So let's do those first. Christoffel 1, 2, 2 is just going to be equal to negative r. We're just multiplying by 1. And down here, gamma 1, 3, 3 is going to be equal to negative r sine squared theta. And next we see that this item and this one, because the first index is 2, are going to need to be multiplied by this expression. So we're going to have gamma 2, 1, 2 equals gamma 2, 2, 1, which equals r times 1 over r squared. It's just 1 over r. And down here we've got... Um, gamma 2, 3, 3, which is equal to this expression times 1 over r squared is just negative sine theta cosine theta, like that. And finally, we're going to need to multiply this one and this one by this expression, and uh, we'll get gamma 3, 1, 3, which is going to be equal to gamma 3, 3, 1. And we're going to multiply this by this expression, which is just going to be 1 over r. And down here, we'll have gamma 3, 2, 3 being equal to gamma 3, 3, 2 which is going to be equal to this term multiplied by this, which is going to be simply the cosine of theta divided by the sine of theta, just like that. And those are our results. So in spherical polar coordinates, the Christoffel symbols of the first kind look like this, and the Christoffel symbols of the second kind look like this. And with that, we're done. Having worked your way through each of these examples, you shouldn't have any trouble deriving the Christoffel symbols for any coordinate system.